Good morning, good morning. Um, I want to uh, publicly apologize for my lateness, but uh, my borough president of the great borough of Brooklyn had a memorial service honoring the men and women who were first responders uh, at the 9-11 event, and um, uh, it, was, it was great to be able to attend that quickly, so I apologize for having you wait. Um, I'd like to think that it was a uh, noble and worthy cause as it relates to the men and women first responders of 9-11. So. Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert Carnegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. We're here today to hold a hearing on three important bills that impact New Yorkers in a variety of different ways. These include intro number 1481 regarding the latest version of the New York City Plumbing Code, proposed intro 1482A requiring the use of bird-friendly glass to prevent fatal bird strikes, and intro number 1661 ensuring that construction workers who attend site safety orientations and refresher courses receive training in their own languages. Today we'll hear from the Department of Buildings, members of the real estate and plumbing industries, labor advocates, environmental advocates, and other interested parties, uh, interested members of the public about these three bills. As discussed above, intro number 1481, of which I am a sponsor, amends the New York City Plumbing Code to bring it up to date with the 2015 International Plumbing Code published by the International Code Council. Local Law 33 for the year 2007 requires that updated construction codes be submitted to the council so that they can be introduced in order to ensure that they are in line with current international codes. The Department of Buildings proposes amendments to those existing codes and it, organized, and it organized committees to review these codes and make recommendations about their adoption. Amendment, amendments recommended for adoption are subsequently heard at a hearing held by this committee. The plumbing code is the first construction code to be heard during the code cycle. Due to the length of the code, we have not inserted the full text of the code into the committee report. If you'd like to see a copy of the full code, you may ask the sergeant at arms to review a copy. Proposed intro 1482A, sponsored by Council Member Espinal, seeks to help prevent bird strike deaths. 100 million to 1 billion birds die annually as a result of collisions with buildings. New York is responsible for 90,000 to 230,000 of those deaths, in part due to its position on the Atlantic Flyway, a route that transverses the city and is traveled by hundreds of thousands of birds annually. Birds are invaluable to the environment. They eat disease-carrying insects, pollutant plants, distribute seeds, and consume weed seeds, which in turn helps maintain biodiversity. Birds cannot de detect glass, and therefore they fly directly into it. This bill requires that 90% of all glass on the first 75 feet of all newly constructed and altered business buildings be made out of glass that prevents bird strikes. Though this measure, through this measure, we hope to stop bird strikes and help protect the bird population. Finally, intro 1661, of which I'm a sponsor, builds on the robust construction safety requirements required under law, local law 196 for the year 2017. Local law 196 requires construction workers to undergo trainings to prevent construction-related accidents. This bill requires that workers at site safety orientations and refreshers receive instructions about trainings required by local law 196 in a language that they can understand. This bill is particularly timely in light of recent construction accidents, including at a site in the Bronx where four construction workers were injured and one, a father of five, unfortunately was killed. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members present today, uh, Farrah Luis and Barry Gudenchik. Um, we will now hear from the sponsor. Oh, Raphael is not here. Espinal is not here. Um, so I just want to, uh, one bit of housekeeping, I'd like to re remind everyone who'd like to testify today to please fill out a card with the sergeant. We'll be sticking to a two minute clock for all public testimony. And now we'll administer the oath to the administration before the testimony. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions? Yes. Yes. You can begin your testimony, but uh, I, I just ask that you identify yourself for the record, obviously. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined today by Gus Siracus, my first Deputy Commissioner. Together, we are pleased to be here to offer testimony in support of the three bills before the committee today. Let me start by thanking the City Council for your ongoing partnership with the Department. We both strive to ensure that this great city of ours, with its over 1 million buildings and 45,000 active construction sites, 
not only has the safest built environment, but that we continue to evolve and grow New York City's leadership in the field of design and development. We are a department dedicated to the safety of all people, whether they live in New York City, work in New York City, build New York City, or visit New York City. We are a department that is dedicated to ensuring workers return home safely every single night, that tenants are safe in their homes and are not displaced by construction work, and that our customers receive the best level of service, all while strengthening our use of data for the benefit of all New Yorkers. Much has changed at the department since the establishment of the Superintendent of Buildings, our earliest known predecessor in 1860. The department went from a unit within the city's fire department to a citywide department of buildings in 1936, and we have grown to a department of nearly 2,000 employees and change throughout the years to respond to the needs of New Yorkers and the ever-evolving needs of an industry we work closely with. However, the one thing that has remained constant throughout our many years is the presence of codes that regulate the construction of buildings, which have existed in New York City in some form since as early as the 17th century. Since that time, our codes have been revised periodically to ensure that they are up to date and that they reflect advancements in technology as well as the latest standards in life safety. The New York City construction codes are the backbone of New York City's built environment. They, coupled with the New York City zoning resolution, which we are responsible for interpreting and enforcing, physically make New York City the place it is today. Today, the committee has before it intro number 1481, which updates the New York City plumbing code, which is part of the construction codes. The department began this construction code revision cycle in 2015. Our code revision process is a true labor of love on the part of our staff and committee members and represents a deep collaborative process. This public-private partnership involves over 645 industry professionals and stakeholders who volunteer their time and sit on 14 different committees, including a managing committee and technical and advisory committees which are organized by discipline. To date, this effort has resulted in over 37,000 total hours of service, of which more than 7,000 hours were spent on just the plumbing code revision. Committee members include architects, engineers, attorneys, and other city agencies, as well as representatives of construction, labor, real estate, and other stakeholder organizations. A list of committee members is available on the department's website. The proposed revisions to the Plumbing Code are based on the 2015 edition of the International Plumbing Code, which are developed by the International Code Council. The International Code Council is an association with over 64,000 members, which is dedicated to developing model codes like the International Plumbing Code. All 50 states, as well as four U.S. territories and the District of Columbia, rely on International Code Council model codes to form the basis of their construction codes. While the proposed revisions use the International Plumbing Code as a base, they also modify or add new language to the plumbing code tailored to the unique needs and characteristics of the city's built environment. This bill makes 840 revisions to the plumbing code. 565 changes came directly from the International Plumbing Code. 169 changes came from the code revision committees. 89 changes were a combination of both and 17 changes were more minor in nature and proposed by the department. This bill also makes two dozen substantive revisions, which include revisions that add new or expanded requirements to the plumbing code. No single amendment or new proposal in this bill was included unless it was first approved by our committees and agreed upon through consensus. Highlights of the revisions being made in the plumbing code by this bill include a new requirement that pipes bear all required markings, including those required by applicable reference standards, which will aid in development inspections. A clarification that multi-tenant facilities may share a drinking fountain, similar to shared public toilet facilities, provided that drinking fountains are available for use on each floor. A new requirement that each well of a multiple compartment sink discharge independently to a waste receptor which strengthens the existing protections against cross-contamination in food handling. 
new provisions related to roof drain flow rates, which will result in a more performance-based approach to, design, to drain designs, and new provisions that limit the cutting away of structural members during the installation or alteration of a plumbing system, which will improve the safety of the joist studs, beams, columns, and other, other structural members that support a building. Before I discuss the remaining bills before the committee, I would like to take a moment to thank the members of the Plumbing Technical Committee and the Administrative and Enforcement Advisory Committee, as well as the Managing Committee, some of whom I see here, who have contributed their expertise and countless hours to produce the bill before the committee today. Now, the Department expects to submit the re revisions to the Energy Code later this year. And we expect to submit revisions to the balance of the construction codes, which include the administrative, building, fuel gas, and mechanical codes, and to the electrical code in 2020. Turning now to construction safety, an area of extreme importance to not only the department, but to this administration and certainly to this council. We are strongly supportive of intro number 1661, which would require the construction workers at certain construction sites receive relevant information regarding site safety training during required site safety orientations. These site safety orientations are required before a worker begins work at a site and each year th thereafter and are required at all construction sites where Local Law 196 construction safety training is mandated. These are sites that require a construction superintendent, site safety coordinator, or site safety manager to be designated which generally means there are new building sites with the exception of construction of one, two, and three family buildings, or that there are sites involving a full demolition of a building or the enlargement of a building. The department supports this bill as it will put valuable information and resources, including applicable deadlines, the types of training required, and total number of hours of training required directly into the hands of workers. This bill will build on the efforts of many to ensure information about site safety training reaches those who need it. Since the enactment of Local Law 196, the Department has continued to perform outreach to our stakeholders. Such outreach includes launching a week of action just this week, which involves direct outreach to workers on construction sites in all five boroughs, and an educational advertising campaign targeted to construction workers, which includes advertisements on television, print media, radio, and the subways. Direct mailings to permit holders for sites where the law is applicable. Direct mailing to site safety professionals reminding them of their obligations. Distribution of educational materials directly to construction workers. Creating our own site safety construction map, which is an interactive tool workers can use to determine whether a job requires site safety training and implementing a rule to require signage within construction sites that provide information to workers about site safety training in all languages spoken at the site. The final bill before the committee, intro number 1482A, which would require that new buildings or buildings replacing glass utilize bird-friendly glass, which is less reflective or transparent. The department shares the goal of reducing the potential for bird collision with glass and we look forward to working with the council, the bill sponsor, and the industry on this proposal. We thank the council for your continued support and look forward to our work together to improve the department on behalf of all New Yorkers. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I was remiss earlier in not congratulating you on your new, relatively new appointment um, and the ability, if I'm not mistaken, to say that you supported all three bills. Thank you, and that is true. We support all three. That is a great way to start your tenure at the, as a commissioner. Uh, we've been joined by um, Councilmember Raphael Espinal, who is one of the bill's spon sponsors and has an opening statement. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing and including uh, my bill, uh, the Bird Friendly Glass Bill, which I uh, uh, believe it's a very important bill in order for us to continue being climate and uh, you know biodiversity advocates here in City Hall. Commissioner, congratulations on your new role. It's been a pleasure working with you in the DOE. We've done a lot of great work together in my district. I look forward to continue our great work uh, with having you as as the new commissioner of the Department of Buildings. So, thank you. Um, I'm Councilman Rafael Espinal, and I'm the, one of the prime sponsors of Intro 1482A. 
Uh, since the last ice age, the land we now call New York City has been an important stop on the Atlantic flyway bird migration route. Despite less and less green space, over 200 species either live or pass through the city, nest in our parks and window frames, and raise their young. Visit any park, and you're likely to see a few dozen people with binoculars looking to the trees, trying to find traces of our city's secret but incredible biodiversity. We've seen this council take historic steps to decrease our carbon footprint. This bill today will add to our environmental legacy as it makes us take responsibility for our role in the ecosystem that existed long before City Hall. As the chair mentioned, over two billion birds die from window collisions every year in the country. And between 90 to 230,000 birds die in New York City alone. This is a staggering statistic, especially because we have the means to reduce it. There's different ways to make glass bird friendly. And we have many experts in the room today who will speak to the details. However, this bill strikes a careful balance in requiring bird-friendly glass only at heights where birds are most likely to be flying. I'm grateful to the many advocates and experts that have worked with our office on this bill so far and look forward to hearing and reading their testimony today. Uh, on top of that, I also want to thank the, uh, the agency and the commissioner for being supportive of this bill and I look forward to getting my colleagues on board and getting this bill passed as soon as possible. Thank you. So I'm going to hope that that's the only clapping for this hearing. And if there is more clapping, I just ask that you do this. Like the birds. It's in, our, it's a, it's in all of our best interest. <laughs> um, we've also been joined by Council Member uh, Fernando Cabrera from the Great Borough of the Bronx. Um, I'd like to begin my line of questioning as it relates um, to the plumbing code. Um, so I, if you could just generally please walk us through the process you use to create the revision of the plumbing code. Absolutely. So the process, as I mentioned, is truly a labor of love. It starts uh, with the staff at the department who uh, go through the International Plumbing Code. In this case, it was the 2015 International Plumbing Code and track every change relative to the existing plumbing code and identify all of the changes with the explanatory notes. From there, it moves into committee. Committee at this, uh, at this stage is the technical uh, plumbing committee, as well as our advisory and managing committees that review and, dr uh, the, and draft and approve all of the proposed revisions. That uh, in itself takes somewhat uh, close to that 7,000 hour that I spoke to. Um, following that, uh, we, re uh, we go through legal review and we are at council for our next step. Now, during committee, that is a very robust back and forth that is had between the stakeholders, and we have representation from the industry um, specific to this discipline, as well as, broadly speaking, the industry across the city that is impacted by changes. And no single edit or change or addition in this plumbing code revision before you was made that did not receive consensus. And so our process truly is uh, collaborative, um, and, and a partnership where we do require that our committees meet uh, and, and receive consensus on each and every single item um, that makes its way into the code, whether it is a simple numbering change or a more um, substantial edit. Thank you. Can you explain what committees were organized to review revisions of the plumbing code, and how did those committees inform the revision process? Because you spoke kind of heavily about it being a collaborative process. Um, so, I, I may not know exactly which committees were solicited sure. in order to participate. So it is the uh, plumbing, uh, the technical committee uh, that sits and reviews the documents prepared by the department uh, staff. And so that technical committee, the plumbing committee, reviews line by line the changes that are being um, uh, made initially from the, um, from the 2015 IPC to our existing code. And from there, we begin a review, again, of line by line, and suggestions are made by committee members for uh, additions or clarifications or, in some cases, removal of items. Um, specific to the, the subject at hand. From there, that document is then, once completed, reviewed by our um, uh, managing committee, excuse me, thank you, and our managing committee, again, by consensus, um, uh, supports the document that the technical committee has produced. So, um, were there other groups or stakeholders 
that were invited to participate? So our committee process is open to, um, to any interested parties. At the beginning of a code revision process, we seek through our, um, through our, our established connections with industry and other stakeholders um, uh, an opportunity for new members to sit on our committees. So we actually have an application on our website where we seek for seek new members of committees to apply to be on that committee. Uh, and they, of course, have to demonstrate um, technical proficiency or connection to the specific uh, trade or discipline that they are seeking to be part of. And again, there are 14 committees that, that touch upon all of the work across the construction code revision process. And just lastly on this code revision, um, how often did the various committees actually meet? You know, I have to get back to you on the exact number of meetings, but for the plumbing specific work that was the basis of the bill before the committee, we have uh, in excess of 7,000 hours of time um, that committee members have dedicated, that these are unpaid positions, um, to that process. So we'll come back to you with the exact number of committee meetings. So that actually completes my first round of questions. I'm going to defer to some of my colleagues hmm? who, who uh, this is a very busy and active uh, legislative day, so I'm going to let my colleagues ask their questions, starting with Barry Gudentry from the Great Borough Queens. And don't you forget that. Lots of birds in Queens. Um, Commissioner, good to see you. We miss you at SCA, but life goes on. Life does go on. Um, how long uh, have we approved this legislation on the plumbing? How long before it gets implemented in total, you estimate? So this plumbing code will not be implemented until the remainder of the construction codes are heard and approved by this council. And so we expect that the remainder of the codes will um, be before the council in 2020, um, the last of which is the electrical code in terms of uh, order. And after we all get together and we have our kumbaya moment on all these code uh, updates, how long do you think it will take to, for your department to implement them? takes about a year, and in that process, remember, so we've gone through a very um, robust collaborative process where we've invited stakeholders who are directly related to the industries at hand and the specific trades at hand, as well as the broader community. However, our engagement does not stop at the committee level. It continues after approval by the council to ensure that each um, uh, member of the, of the broader universe is aware of changes that have been made. And so we will be continuing our outreach effort after. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank, Thank you. you, Council Member. If there's no, no more questions on the uh, plumbing code, I'm gonna get to apparently why we're all here. Uh, <laughs> Bird-friendly glass. Um, would buildings making alterations under LL 97 2019 fall under these sections of the code? Uh, sorry, say that question one more time. Would, would buildings making alterations under, uh, under this legislation fall under these sections of the code? Section 27? Yes. Yeah, so um, the sections you're referring to are the uh, provisions in the code that, res uh, that correspond back to the 1968 uh, code and uh, uh, oversee the, the um, triggers for the alterations of buildings that comply with that building code. So um, we do expect that some buildings may fall under that, but as we read the legislation, we understand it to impact um, uh, certainly new uh, buildings that are coming along, and we do expect that a portion of existing buildings will be covered. And certainly, if there is a different intention, we'd be happy to work with the council and committee on, on striking that balance. Well, I, I guess for me, is there any way to estimate the amount of buildings that would be affected uh, by this new law? With respect to the specific provision you spoke about, certainly a number of buildings that are seeking alterations, typically an alteration to 
um, are doing so under the 68 code as there are existing buildings that, that are uh, applicable to that code. So it would be hard to say of that universe, of which it would be a significant number, how many uh, would be uh, required because of this. But let us look, look at that a little more and see if we can get you um, a better sense of, of universe there. And then I'm just curious, um, is there a way to estimate the, the cost of these alterations? Um, obviously, it's built in new construction. It'll be built in uh, that cost. But these alterations, is there any way to estimate um, the cost? The cost specific to the incremental change for this type of glass or across the board? Across the board. We can go back and look at the numbers. Applicants are required to provide a cost um, for, the, for the project. So we can go back and see if we can pull that information. And I would just suggest um, from a DOB standpoint that we have an opportunity here uh, in these alterations to bring in MWBE companies. Um, and I would strongly suggest that that's a process that we look at. So there's an opportunity for obviously revenue to be generated in these alterations. I would just um, really like to employ the Department of Buildings to be very aggressive in trying to solicit for um, the participate participation of MWBE companies in the city. We couldn't agree. Where the department can, we want to uh, grow our support of MWBE firms. Uh, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Hel Helen Rosenthal from the Great Borough of Manhattan. Uh, the bill sponsor uh, has a question. Raphael Espinel. I'm not going to test my luck too much. I'm glad to hear that you're on board, but I'm going to push a little bit further. Okay. Um, to my knowledge, there, there's this special film that uh, developers can put on their glass without making any real retrofit, doing any retrofit work. Are you aware of that film that exists? I'm not aware of the specific film that you're referring to. I am aware conceptually that some folks have raised this as a possibility. Would, would uh, applying that type of film potentially, would, requ would it require potentially DOB uh, permits of any sort? Again, not being specific with the exact one that you're speaking of, um, I would say um, it is unlikely. Okay. All right. I I'll, I'll guess I'll ask some of the folks who testify on, on those specific questions. But uh, I only ask because I am toying with the idea that if this film is low cost, potentially requiring it on, on some retrofits um, on, on buildings that potentially may do some window work in the future. So, so st uh, staying with uh, Council Member Espinal's line of questioning, um, uh, what what are other alternative bird-friendly measures that can be implemented besides uh, just solely uh, installing bird-friendly glass? I think that is a very good question. That is a question that I probably don't have a good answer for. So I would say this. The, the, the department is supportive of the goals the council is seeking to address with this bill. So. Where we can, the department would like to work with the council to ensure that whatever version of the bill um, should move forward, if it, met, if it does, that we are in a position where we can implement the goals and, and achieve such goals, and, and making sure that we are working with our partners in the industry and broadly to ensure that this is actionable. Uh, so to your knowledge, are there any buildings in New York City that, that have already implemented bird friendly measures? And if so, what was the outcome? So the department, when we are going through our plan review process, are looking at exteriors of all types of buildings. And we are doing so. Tr typically, we're looking for items like sustainability measures um, and conformance with certain um, uh, performance standards that the department expects. We do not uh, look for the uh, specific threat uh, count for a window. However, that being said, we are aware of, um, uh, uh, of a renovation recently that did install bird-friendly glass at the Javits Center. Um, and so I can say we are aware of that. I'm not aware of a, of a specific outcome um, following that um, installation of that glass. So unfortunately for us at the council, um, we produce many very laudable bills. And on the flip side, the enforcement portion of that uh, becomes an issue. Um, do you foresee any enforcement issues with this bill? Let us work together on how the language will take place. I think it's a little too early to determine what enforcement actions are needed. 
Um, so let us work together and ensure that ultimately, again, as we are supportive of the goal behind the bill, that we're in a position where we can effectuate whatever change it is that we're required to do. Um, I bring that up because I really would like to work with the bill sponsor and DOB to make sure that we can mitigate the, um, any enforcement issues at the end. Because again, I, I, I will illustrate that we've uh, produced uh, in my tenure here probably some of the most laudable, sustainable bills in the nation and are faced with having to address them on the opposite end two years later from an enforcement standpoint. And I think that if we address it up front, um, we may find a way to mitigate some of what we find happens after bills have been, been implemented. So I, I'd really like to be able to do that with the bill sponsor uh, and with DOB from a, committee, uh, from a committee chair perspective. We would greatly appreciate that, and I certainly will make um, any, any uh, number of my staff available. We have competent, uh, uh, skilled professionals um, who would be happy to participate in that. Thank you. Um, Helen Rosenthal. Oh, thank you so much, Chair. Just a quick question and suggestion for the bill sponsor and for Department of Buildings. I'm very proud to be a co-sponsor of 1482A, and I really thank um, the leadership at DOB for their support. One idea, I don't know how this would be effectuated, but um, is to uh, uh, find a way to immediately address buildings that have a high incidence of, um, of um, birds hitting windows and dying. And I have such a building in my dis right outside of my district. And every day, birds are found on the streets right around the building. Um, so I'm wondering if there could be some sort of complaint-driven system where um, people could call in. There would be a mechanism for people to call in and identify such locations, and um, upon you know maybe some sort of validation by DOB that those buildings would be required to put up a film or you know whatever treatment could be done pretty that's pretty readily available. Again, we're we are supportive of the goal that the council is striving to achieve with this legislation how the legislation ultimately uh, uh, takes shape and what the role the department will have in the enforcement and, uh, uh, and other areas in that legislation, let us work together. With respect to a specific complaint-driven system, I'm certainly open to it. Um, let's look at, it, at whether the department is the right holder of that versus another agency, but certainly Again, we are supportive of the, of the goal that the Council is striving to achieve, and we will work with you in order to ensure that the Department is able to meet our, uh, our, our goals here. Thank you so much. And Commissioner, only because this is the first time I'm seeing you at a hearing, welcome. Thank you. Really excited to have you at Department of Buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so just I would like to kind of stick on uh, Councilmember Rosenthal's point. Um, currently, who, if anyone, or where, if any place, are incidents by building owners, developers, and or tenants reported? With respect to? Uh, uh, bird incidents. You, you know, I, I don't know of a, of a system that handles that type of complaint. I, I, you know, I don't know. We can look into it. Yeah, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be interested to find out if people are reporting incidences to 311 or if there's a, a catchment system in place already, and if so, what it is, because I'm wondering if a tenant or building owner uh, recognizes an incident, whether it's consistent or not, right? So obviously we've identified that there is a flight pattern, um, which I didn't know. My 12-year-old my twins probably could have told me that, but I, I, I didn't know that personally, that they're, that they're, you know, New York is in a flight path. Um, how, how are we capturing the data around how many incidents take place per year, who's reporting, and to where are they reporting it? I, I, both you and Councilmember Rosenthal raise a very good point. And so, again, we'll, we'll commit, I will commit my department to work with the Council on, on how we can effectuate the goals that you're striving to meet here and, and where the department's role should be and ensuring that we're ready and able to do that. Obviously, the goal of this very laudable bill is to either reduce or actually eliminate 
these incidences, I don't know how I could statistically substantiate or any reduction if there's not a system that is in place to report it. So I'd certainly like to work with the bill sponsor and DOB to try to find a, a system that allows us to there's a there's a portion for testimony, and I hope you signed up and you can answer those questions if you're if you're an advocate. Um, so, are there any more questions by my colleagues? I actually don't have any more questions. I can't guarantee that all our interactions will be this pleasurable. <laughs> um, so I just want to say that up front. I accept that. Um, but 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 thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you very much. So we're going to call it the first panel. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Adam Vinson, Elias Markey Ratner, and uh, John Dean are our first panel. If your name has been called, please report to the um, to testify at the at the bench. Sorry. I understand that our first panelists are a group of students, which I'm excited about hearing from. I would like to remind you and their parents that they are on a two-minute time clock. As cute as they are, <laughs> still two minutes. So students, I ask before you begin your testimony that you state your name, first and last name, for the record. You can begin whenever you'd like. Uh, hi, my name is Adam Vinson. Uh, Adam Vinson. Adam, can I ask you to just speak a little bit louder? Uh, so my that name can... is Adam Vinson. My name is John Dean. My name is Elias Markey Ratner. You can begin your testimony. Adam? Uh, hi, my name is Adam Vinson. I live in District 4 and I'm a junior at Eleanor Roosevelt High School in Manhattan. I'm the founder of my school's Naturalist Club, a member of the New York State Young Birders Club, and I'm also a volunteer with New York City Audubon at their Project Safe Flight program to monitor migratory birds and window collisions. I also volunteer at the Wild Bird Front, uh, New York City's only wildlife rehabilitation center for birds. Helping birds that migrate through our city is incredibly important, and I'm speaking here today to encourage you to vote in favor of law intro 1482A. I have seen with my own eyes the consequences glass window collisions have on migratory birds. I hope the city council takes this bill seriously. It's a small measure that could help our planet a lot. New York City is an incredible, impor incredibly important spot on the Eastern Flyway, a bird migration route. Twice a year, millions of birds fly through the city, and while New York is an incredibly important place, it's also incredibly dangerous for birds. Uh, in Manhattan, both Central Park and Bryant Park, which are major birding spots, are completely surrounded by glass windows buildings. Uh, when the birds hit the windows, they often die in especially painful and grotesque ways. I found song sparrows, hermit thrushes, and yellow-bellied sapsuckers with their necks snapped. Unfortunately, they were the lucky ones. Other birds often have their beaks snapped and gain internal injuries that eventually kill them. Most birds that survive the initial strike often die within a month. When I volunteer at the Wild Bird Fund, I often feed the migratory birds. One day, I found one of them, a brown creeper, dead. It had struck a window and died the next day. Brown creepers are incredibly tiny, fragile, and unique birds, so seeing one dead was deeply depressing. This year, I made a petition at my school supporting bird like strike legislation. Over 170 Eleanor Roosevelt students signed, including most of my grade. I also created an online version of the petition, which quickly got another 259 signatures. I hope uh, this response demonstrates to you that when people are made aware of the consequences of poorly designed glass windowed buildings, they care and want to see change. Birds mean a lot to me, and my interest in them has made my life better. Now is my time to give back to them. I ask all of you to support this bill as it, there is no good reason that you shouldn't. If the bill passes, nobody gets hurt and the birds who just desperately need our help are supported. 
So thank you, Adam. Um, I'm just going to ask for the first time probably in uh, council member history that you actually state your age as well. Uh, I'm 16. Thank you. My name is John Z, and I'm 11 years old. Yes. John, you're first. It's not on. My name is John Dean, and I'm 11 years old. For my whole life, I've called New York City my home. I've always been passionate about birds, watching them in urban parks every, whenever I get the chance. For a while, I've also been aware of the migratory birds that die each year in our city from colliding with glass windows. When I was in thir third grade, I wrote a letter to Mayor de Blasio requesting that less tall buildings are constructed in New York City to reduce migratory bird deaths. But today, using modern technology, we have the ability to make a compromise. The Bird Safe Buildings Act would preserve populations of migratory birds while allowing developers to build high rises. But there are other reasons why we should protect birds. They have taught us so much over the years. Travelers lost in a desert used to follow birds to find water. More recently, high-tech drones have been modeled after the flight of birds. The Wright brothers even designed the first successful airplanes to mimic aspects of avian flight. Birds have helped and continue to help us throughout history and in current times. During the, World War, the, war, the wars of one, World War I and II, pigeons were used to deliver messages to soldiers across enemy lines. One particular pigeon named Cher Ami, French for dear friend, was awarded the Dickin Medal for her bravery in World War War II. In 1848, settlers in the state of Utah's crops were being devoured by a cricket plague, but huge flocks of California gulls devoured the insects, saving the lives of many. Today, vultures eat dead animal carcasses, preventing the spread of deadly diseases. In the past, there have been consequences when bird species were threatened by humans. In China, during the late 1950s and early 1960s, the Chinese government started the Four Pest Campaign. One of the targeted animals was the Eurasian tree sparrow. Across China, millions of sparrows were killed because they were believed to eat crops. The sparrow population was greatly diminished, allowing the populations of their main prey, caterpillars, to increase dramatically and consume much of the crops in China. This was one of the main contributing factors to the Great Chinese Famine. If, if the Bird Safe Buildings Law is passed, it will not only be a win for birds, but a win for people, too. My name is Elias Markey Ratner, and I'm in the fourth grade at a public school in the East Village. I love birds. I've been studying them and birding since kindergarten. It's really important to me to save birds from the threats we've put in their way. Many kids my age have never held a bird, live or dead. I've been lucky enough to hold many live birds, but I've held even more dead ones, and every time it makes me sad. The reason I do this is because I work as a volunteer with New York City Audubon's Project Safe Flight. We monitor dangerous buildings where birds collide with windows and hopefully help to end this problem. Here is what I've seen as a Project Safe Flight volunteer. This past weekend in the Wall Street area, we monitored six tall buildings that are dangerous to birds. In the space of 45 minutes, we found four victims, two dead and two badly injured and dying. These included my beautiful migrating songbirds like the chestnut-sided warbler, black and white warbler, well, and black and white warbler, sorry. I also saw an injured common yellow throat that had just bounced off a large mirrored glass window. And that was only one morning at a handful of buildings. Imagine hundreds of thousands of birds that are killed or injured every year in New York City after colliding with buildings that have unsafe windows. Before I started volunteering, I thought the idea of these beautiful birds hitting windows and dying was terrible, but actually witnessing it is 10 times worse. I volunteer with Project Safe Flight to help birds thrive and survive, and that's where you can help us. 
please pass the bird friendly glass bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dad, are, are you there for moral support or to offer testimony? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm aware acutely that the Torah, the Bible, the Quran always have all have references to being led by children and the importance of listening to the voice of children. I want to thank you for your testimony offered here today, and it gives me and the members of my committee a great opportunity to hear a perspective of the future and not be regimented in um, what's happening today. So I want to thank you all for your testimony and let you know that it really means a lot to this council for you to spend your time here giving testimony. Thank you. Any, any comments? Hi. Uh, uh, let me just say we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Carlina Rivera from the Great Borough of Manhattan. Thank you. I, you go to school in the East Village, right? Yeah. Which school? East Village Community School. That's a great school. It's, it happens to be in my district. Um, so, and, and the other, you're, you're all incredible, and I just want to thank you. Uh, this is a really important piece of legislation. Is this the letter that you wrote to Blasio? Yes. It's very good. I agree. Pigeons are not as bad as he thinks they are. Actually, I'm th I think I'm going to sign on to that letter. Yeah, this is a good letter. And I just wanted to tell you, I'm, I'm a council member that maybe has more bird legislation than any other council member. And I'm really excited uh, to work with you if you can stay in touch with my office, uh, because I think you're great advocates. And I wanted to tell you that I am uh, supporting and, and really excited to pass it along with the council members. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to call the next panel. Thank you for your testimony. George Basilino slash Arthur Goldstein. Okay. Ed Bosco. This panel is uh, more related to the plumbing code. Uh, Dorothy Massarella. David Balkin. And Philip Parisi Jr. Again, I ask before you begin your testimony that you state your name in its entirety for the record. We can begin wherever you like. Um, I believe that uh, chivalry suggests, uh, but I can't tell you what to do. Let's see. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, chairman, members and staff of the City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings, my name is Dottie Mazzarella. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations for the International Code Council, or ICC. The ICC is a member-focused association dedicated to helping the building community provide safe, resilient, and sustainable construction through the development and use of model codes, called the International Codes, and standards used in the design, construction, and compliance process. Most U.S. states and communities, federal agencies, and many global markets choose the I-Codes to set the standards for regulating construction, plumbing and sanitation, fire prevention, energy conservation in the built environment. I appreciate the opportunity to submit testimony in support of intro 1481 to update the New York City Plumbing Code to the 2015 International Plumbing Code, or IPC, with amendments that reflect this, the unique character of the city. As the commissioner mentioned, the I-Codes are currently adopted at the state or local level in all 50 states, New York City, the District of Columbia, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. The I-Codes are also used internationally in the Caribbean, Central America, the Middle East, Georgia, and Mexico. The International Plumbing Code, uh, which intro 481 is based upon, is in use or adopted in 35 states, New York City, the District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, Trinidad and Tobago, the Cayman Islands, and Colombia. The I-Codes are revised and updated every three years by a national consensus process that strikes a balance between the latest technology and new building products, ec economics, and cost, while providing for the most recent advances in public and first responder safety and installation techniques. The I-Codes are correlated to work together without conflicts to eliminate confusion in building design or inconsistent code enforcement among different jurisdictions. 
The ICC co-development process is open, inclusive, and encourages input from all individuals and groups and allows for those governmental members, including representatives from New York City, to determine the final code provisions. I am very pleased that several New York City building and fire department staff and other organizations in the city participated at the most recent hearings. And I guess you can read the rest. <laughs> I, I, I would let you com complete your testimony, but I am asking that if you're in favor of it, if you could be a little bit more concise going forward. If Absolutely. It, not you particularly, but just as we go forward, we have a few panels that we'd like to get to. So please okay. complete. Okay, sure. Um, so the current New York City construction codes and other local laws have been incorporated into the 2015 I codes, which includes the 2015 IPC. This involvement and participation by personnel from the Department of Buildings is critical to the success of future versions of the I codes. The technical and practical expertise of New York City building and fire officials, design professionals, builders, contractors, labor representatives, and all organizations interested in building safety are vital to your adoption efforts as well as ours. New York City is one of many jurisdictions that val values public and first responder safety and the protection of our built environment by updating plumbing, building, fire, and energy codes. By regularly updating your construction codes, the city provides the safest and economically prudent climate for its citizens since it will allow for the use of new construction standards and methods. Accordingly, Intro 481 will update the city's plumbing code to reflect recent building safety and efficiency standards developed by the nation's leading building plumbing, fire department, building officials, scientists, builders, general and plumbing contractors, architects, engineers, product manufacturers, and discipline-specific associations with those modifications unique to the city. I would just like to thank you uh, for the opportunity and continue a partnership working together. Thank you, um, Ms. Mazzarella. I would like to say um, for the record, and for future reference, the millennial font single space is murder for, us, for those of us who'd like to follow along. Thus? <laughs> so please, please have that recorded in the record. I wanted to keep it to one so page that, <laughs> for you. No, I, I, know what you, I know what you did, but uh, just for, the, for future reference, the millennial font, I have respect for millennials, and the single space is murder for us who'd like to follow along. Yes. Thank, thank you, you, though. <laughs> Good morning, Council. My name is Phil Parisi. I'm here to support for, uh, Intro 1481, the proposed updated plumbing code for the City of New York. I'm an associate principal and head of the Plumbing and Fire Protection Department at MG Engineering, <clears throat> and currently the chair of the uh, New York City Code Revision Plumbing Technical Committee, a member of the committee, man, uh, New York City Code Managing Committee, and a member of the licensed master plumber but Master Fire Suppression Contractors Licensing Board. During the previous code revision cycles, which began in 2006, I participated as a technical committee member and in 2011 participated as a co-chair of the New York City Code Revision Plumbing Technical Committee, along with num numerous other members. Both of these efforts resulted in the 2008 and subsequently the 2014 New York City Plumbing Code. Over the last 12 years, the committee comprised mostly of volunteers, Department of Building staff, and other city agencies have worked together to adapt the 2003 International Plumbing Code to meet the special needs of New York City, and then update the former 2008 New York City Plumbing Code to, meet the, to be further in line with the 2009 International Plumbing Code, resulting in the 2014 New York City Plumbing Code, which is currently in place today. Similarly, in to previous years, the goal of New York City Department of Buildings and the industry as a whole is to maintain a similar revision cycle as the International Code Council, maintaining a high quality and keeping up with the latest industry technology and practices. For the past 12 years, I've been part of this code revision process. The time and effort put into the New York City based on consent, feedback, and other industry professionals and community response. I found that the plumbing code simplified is easier to apply in practice while maintaining high quality standards. Kevin? I'd, I'd like to hear some of, um, you, you've, you, you've indicated some highlights. If you could just hit those highlights for me. I'd oh, highlight. Um, the Plumbing Technical Committee com kicked off in uh, July 2017, comprised of 45 members. We've uh, spent over two years, 
200 hours in committee, uh, committee meetings alone, approximately 40 meetings so far, which comprised of the New York City plumbing code as well as the fuel gas code, although it's not part of this intro. Um, and we've engaged in implementing changes that would improve the New York City construction codes, removing amb ambiguity and improve the safety and performance of new and existing buildings. Some highlights, we've added and refined the definitions within the code to better reflect today's technology and terminology as well as coordinated with the New York City DEP and Subsurface Plumbers Association to align with building drain and sewer uh, terminology. We've coordinated multiple sections among the administrative sections for licensing, plumbing, fuel gas, and fire codes to simplify and make them consistent across the construction codes. Significant achievement <clears throat> was the creation of Chapter 14 subsurface landscape and irrigation systems, which is new, aligns the standards with the industry and New York City DEP for the discharge of stormwater to subsurface irrigation systems. Majority of the effort was put to minor revisions to incorporate safety requirements, alignment with the New York City Energy Code, alignment with tech technical bulletins issued by the DOB, materials of piping systems, method of support of piping, and required testing for plumbing systems. Another significant achievement was the coordination with the DEP detention facility requirements, adding detailed diagrams for clarity and to eliminate conflicts which may have exist, existed in previous years during the design and approval process of site connections. So, uh, Mr. Parisi, I thought that it was important to have those highlights uh, read into uh, the record mm -hmm. um, because I know the amount of work that was put in for doing this. So I, just, I, want, I, want to, I want to thank you, and I extended the time because I thought it was important for that to be entered into the record, not only in um, your written testimony, but to be heard. Thank so you. I, I, want, I, want to, I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> My name is David Balkin. I'm the Vice President of the New York City Subsurface Plumbers Association. I'm here to speak about Intro 1481, which is an all-encompassing document updating the New York City Plumbing Code. In this association's previous response to Intro 1481, we had stated serious concerns about the proposed change in the definition of a building drain our concerns included creating an overlapping and confusing inspection process overseen by both the DEP and the DOB. This confusion would have been brought about by extending the definition of a building drain to the property line. It would have also resulted in needless additional charges of approximately $5,900 to any property owner who required house sewer work. More seriously <clears throat> was the very real potential for bo both bodily injury and property damage due to excavations having to be left open. I'm pleased to report our above concerns have been appreciated and fully addressed by both the DOB and the DEP. The new definition of a building drain as proposed now is defined as ending at the outside of the foundation wall as opposed to at the property line of a premise. This simple and logical change in wording will save New York City property owners thousands of dollars and will eliminate the potential of open excavations causing bodily injury and property damage. The process that resulted in this very positive change in the definition of, of a building drain was seamless and the industry's concerns were treated as meaningful. On behalf of my industry and my association, I would like to state that taking part in Intro 1481 was quite a pleasant experience. It is refreshing when government and industry can work together for the common good. I would like to thank all those that took part in producing Intro 1481 for your considerable time and effort. Are you entering this testimony not under duress? <laughs> not at all. I'm just kidding. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, uh, George Bessolino has arrived. If you could just join us, please. I'm sorry, please. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Ed Bosco, I'm a licensed professional engineer. Uh, I'm managing principal of ME Engineers. It's a, a New York City firm with uh, offices around the country. Uh, I'm also a vice chair of the American Council of Engineering Companies. I've been a member of the HVAC boiler and, and technical committee that, that's developed the other sections of the codes that, that complement what 
Mr. Parisi is done. On behalf of the American Council of Engineering Companies of New York, I'd like to thank Chairman Cornegie and the members of the committee for their efforts over the years to update the city's construction codes. I'm here to testify in support of Intro 1481, which proposes revisions to update the New York City Plumbing Code. Founded in 1921, ACC New York is one of the oldest continuing organizations of professional consulting engineers in the U.S. We represent close to 300 consulting engineering and affiliate firms throughout New York State with a concentration uh, in New York City. Our members plan and design the structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, civil, environmental, fire protection, and technology systems for the city's buildings and infrastructure. Over the years, hundreds of ACEC New York members have donated countless hours chairing and serving on the technical committees convened by the DOB to assist with the revision of the city's construction codes. The technical committees work closely with DOB and the construction community to address issues associated with the adoption of the IPC for use in New York City. We, think that we thank the DOB for this high level of collaboration and for continuously improving on the process for updating the construction codes based on industry feedback. During the current code revision cycle, 120 members of the ACEC New York have served on the technical and managing committees. The plumbing and technical committee that assisted the DOB in drafting the plumbing code revision uh, being considered today is chaired by Phil Parisi of MG Engineering, who is also the chair of the ACEC New York Plumbing Code Committee. I feel old, but Phil and I have been working on these codes longer than the prior panel has been alive. <laughs> we, we applaud the work of the DOB's Plumbing Technical Committee and understand that it's a two-tier process with further review by a managing committee composed of representatives from all sectors of industry and government. The end result is truly a consensus document. Going forward, ACEC New York members will continue to work with other DOB technical code committees and the City Council to ensure that the updates reflect the on-the-ground issues encountered by our engineers, architects, and builders every day, as well as the best practices for safety and sustainability. We respectfully offer our support for this current round of amendments, which reflect those objectives and urge the council to swiftly pass this bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Bosco, for that. Um, anybody remember Evelyn Wood? Yep. Yeah, that was a classic example. I didn't mean to age myself, but uh, Evelyn Wood speed reading. I'm, a, I'm 52. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks. Oh, ready? Uh, good morning, Cor uh, Chairman Carnegie. My morning. name is George Bassolino. I am the Secretary of the Master Plumbers Council of the City of New York. The Master Plumbers Council represents over 250 licensed master plumbers throughout the city. And I'd like to take, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to submit testimony today. This current code revision is provided the Department of Buildings the opportunity to update the plumbing code to continue to maintain the highest level of public safety for the residents of New York City. Most of these proposed changes are to bring us in line with the 2015 International Plumbing Code. Um, while technological advances in methods and materials may work in other parts of the country, they're not always um, really fit for New York City. And one of the primary functions of this committee was to ensure that we selected only the best materials and methods. Over the past two years, members of our association have been privileged to work with this committee. Um, we appreciate the fact that the DOB has taken all of our um, thoughts, suggestions, and um, as you said, we've compiled a consensus code here, what you have before, and as such, the Master Plumbers Council is supportive of, of the bill as written. However, we realize that there are many interested parties and everyone may have a suggestion or a comment, and our only request is that those suggestions or comments be sent back to the full plumbing committee for consideration, and then we would be happy to consider them and send them back to you. Um, the main goal of the MPC and the Council is consistent it's to best protect the public safety um, of the residents in New York. And in order to do this, uh, we need to provide them with a plumbing code that is both modern, efficient, and affords them the highest level of public safety. Uh, please remember that plumbers are the first line of defense when it comes to protecting the public's health. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, the only thing I'm going to request probably is that the council reconvene to talk about the enforcement. Because usually, again, you know, and, and thank God today we're here in agreement, um, but we really find issues around the second component to the great work that the, co the committee put in, uh, which is the enforcement component. Right? So that it doesn't have a disproportionate impact, negative impact on, on, on businesses and on the industry. So I certainly like to reconvene the committee at some point to discuss uh, the enforcement component to it. We greatly, greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to call the uh, next panel. Thank you all for your testimony. Stefan Kunst, um, Christine Shepard, uh, yeah, Catherine Heights, but we're gonna use them towards the end. Daniel Pacelli, Georgia Silver Sermon, 
I'm sorry, Silver Siemens. Silvera Siemens, I apologize. That was. As you're assembling, I just ask that be, before you begin your testimony that you state your name clearly for the record, first and last name, thank you. Once you're seated comfortably, you can begin your testimony at any time. I, I generally err on the side of chivalry, but it's your panel, so. Yes, you too. Last September, am I on? Is this on? There we go. Last September, after a day of birding at Jamaica Bay, I got a real shock at the shiny glass Howard Beach station. I happened upon a dozen American red starts, adorable little warblers litting the sidewalk. They were all dead. As I stood there in semi-shock, a teary-eyed woman approached me. She sobbed, it's like this every day now. It's horrible. Somebody ought to do something. I'm Katherine Heinz, Executive Director of New York City Audubon, and I'm somebody who can do something. I testify today to voice New York City Audubon's support for Introduction 1482A. As the lead bird conservation organization in this community, we know the threats that birds face. We have been studying the negative effects of habitat loss, human disturbance, and now climate change on birds in New York City for 40 years. We know that reflective glass and transparent glass on buildings are the deadliest obstacles migratory birds encounter here. Our team has evidence that up to 230,000 birds die each year in New York City alone colliding with glass on buildings. This is our community's sad contribution to the one billion birds killed by glass collisions each year across the country. It is a conservation crisis. Bird safe glass and bird safe design work. Uh, in, by 2006, the Javits Center was the top bird killer on our surveys. Hundreds, um, if not thousands, of birds were dying each year. The 2013 sustainability uh, renovation there to install fritted and low reflective glass reduced bird collisions by ni over 90 percent. But that renovation is an exception. Legislation is imperative to save birds at citywide and hemispheric scales. Toronto, San Francisco, San Jose, Portland already have mandates. Uh, there are many other, others underway, including in Chicago. New York City should lead by doing it best. Um, we need a holistic approach to kill fewer birds. Passing this legislation is part of the process. Like all of you, we envision a future living, working, and thriving in a more sustainable city, but to be truly better and environmentally embracing, the definition of sustainability must include bird friendly. Our infrastructure mustn't kill wildlife. Thank you again for the invitation to share this testimony. Uh, we stand ready to provide you with data, research, recommendations, and stories from all across the city. Thank you, Chair Carnegie, Council Members, Committee Council, for your hard work here. We look forward to working with the new Commissioner, Melanie LaRocca, to provide her with the data we do have on buildings like the Javits Center. Um, we have a tool for reporting and doing scientific monitoring of buildings, and we look forward to sharing that as well. I've also included uh, 20 copies of a slideshow for your visual pleasure, um, and you'll also see some examples of bird safe buildings in New York City at the end of that packet. Thank you. So uh, generally, I wouldn't stop you in, in between, but I am interested in getting as much data as I can to, so that we can demonstrate the reduction and or elimination when it takes place. Yes. Uh, but we need to be able to measure this, right? So. Uh, and we do. New York City Audubon has been um, monitoring bird collisions for a number of years now, since the 90s. And we have even created a tool that's web-based called D-Bird, where a citizen can report a dead bird when they find it on the street. And we do have that data, and it's mapped. Most of the data right now is in Manhattan, which is where we've launched the tool, but it's spreading out into Brooklyn, into Queens, into the Bronx, and into Staten Island, um, as more and more people are using it. So it's a crowdsourced tool. Um, but we also have been monitoring specific buildings. So in the example of the Javits Center, we had data, scientific data, of the number of bird strikes on that building before the retrofit and then after. And that's how we got to the 90% reduction. And I respect, I respect your work. I, I definitely like to um, be included in any demonstration done on that 
um, on that system. I, I'd, love, love, I'd love to. to see it. And then I'd like to see what we can do as a council to potentially build it out to some degree. That would be fantastic. And or educate citizens about its availability. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Christine Shepard, director of the Glass Collisions Program for American Bird Conservancy. Thank you for allowing me to testify on their behalf uh, in support of INT 1482. I've worked full time on glass collisions since 2009. Um, I helped create a lead credit for reducing bird collisions. I teach continuing ed classes to architects uh, for AIA and lead credit. I authored ABC's publication, Bird Friendly Building Design. Um, most especially, I work on developing the science uh, behind solutions to collisions. Um, I developed a, a system for glass rating um, out in Pennsylvania um, so that we can compare one type of material with another in terms of how effective it is in reducing collisions. I work with a number of glass companies, um, encouraging them to increase the number of materials available for doing bird-friendly design. So the situation these days is very different from what it was 10 years ago. There are many, many, many uh, types of materials available to do bird-friendly design. Architects have actually been designing bird-friendly structures for decades, longer than that, without knowing it. There are many features of sustainable design, especially those related to control of sunlight, heat, and also security, that are bird-friendly. Bird-friendly design neither requires relinquishing the openness and light provided by glass, nor seriously impedes mar marketability of buildings. Um, it's critical, however, that the elements of bird-friendly design be considered at the beginning of the design process and carried through to the building's completion. Legislation is the only way that this is going to happen on a reliable basis. Um, ABC also uh, supports some adjustments to the bill, which will be articulated uh, by my colleague from the Bird Safe Buildings Alliance. Um, I would just la ask, is that is, can I count on you to submit to me um, what I actually committee? said? <laughs> What I actually said instead no, of what? Well, that too, but um, <laughs> I'd, I'd actually, um, uh, the cost um, uh, around these retrofits is something that I'd like to be able to Absolutely. present efficiently and effectively to people who are willing to, to go this route. Because yes. there are some people I know personally who have uh, enacted these things in their buildings prior to the legislation. Um, I'd like to be able to introduce also a cost-effective way to meet the mandate of bird-friendly glass. So you said that there are different materials at this point that can be used, and as, as you know, obviously technology dictates as we go forward that there'll be other more effective and efficient ways Absolutely. to meet the needs. Um, I'd like to stay in contact to, to try to make sure that we Terrific. can provide that for... That's uh, my job. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Good morning. Should I go? Hello, I'm Dan Paselli, an architect and director of sustainability at FX Collaborative Architects. I'm here on behalf of my office and the American Institute of Architects in New York. Both are in support of this bill. The bird glass collision issue is part of a larger problem with human impacts on the environment. The United Nations estimates that one million species of animals and plants are threatened with extinction because of us. That scale of ecological loss <clears throat> erodes the foundations of our economies, food security, and quality of life worldwide. Bird collisions are a growing environmental land use issue that contributes to this problem. Glassy buildings degrade habitat to the tunes of hundreds of millions of bird deaths every year in North America. As architects, we often use glass to connect people with nature, but if done wrong, that glass <clears throat> can literally kill the nature we seek to connect with. Fortunately, there are bird safe glass solutions. I've been working on this since 2005 and have been involved with a number of bird safe buildings. Multiple strategies are available, such as simple insect screens, solar shading elements, reduced reflectivity, decorative patterns, such as this one, and barely visible ultraviolet coatings, such as this one. I'm sorry, is that a, is that a film? 
um, I'm going to go over my time limit with the question, but uh, this is specifically a um, ceramic frit that is made of a kind of metal, uh, similar to low E coatings that are required anyway. Uh, it happens to be very new and very expensive because it's new. Thank you. I, I won't interrupt you again. Go ahead. <laughs> as long as you're okay with me going over. So. Uh, so the, the simplest way for, say, a large building in New York to deal with this is patterns like the one I've shown you, uh, which adds only a fraction of a percent uh, to, the, to the cost of uh, such a building. Uh, we used patterned glass at the Javits Center and reduced bird fatalities there by 90 percent while also reducing solar heat gain and air conditioning loads. Uh, the Statue of Liberty Museum has a different glass pattern. <clears throat> After a year of, of, of being, being installed, there have been no collisions and no aesthetic criticism. The Columbia University School of Nursing has another bird safe pattern that's decorative, gives privacy to the students, and reduces glare for the neighborhood. Those are all institutional building owners, but commercial and residential building owners are hesitant to use these things because of concerns of cost uh, and market expectations um, for lots of clear glass. As a result, there are very few um, bird-safe commercial and residential buildings in New York City. In fact, one of ours that we designed has a current tragic uh, bird collision problem. So most building owners will not do this on their own, and that's why legislation is necessary. So AIA New York recommends adoption of the uh, adjustments that my colleague Stefan is going to describe and we strongly recommend uh, council approve the bill. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Stefan Knust. I'm an architect and the director of sustainability at NEAD Architects. I'm also an active member of AIA New York. My office worked with Chris in developing the lead pilot credit 55 after our own experience with work in the city, um, bird collision deterrence which has become the most popular pilot credit in the U.S. Green Building Council's LEED certification program. I'm testifying this morning on behalf of the Bird Safe Building Alliance, an advocacy organization that serves as the technical advisory group for Pilot Credit 55. We assist designers, manufacturers, and vested stakeholders in applying the scientific knowledge behind this credit to their projects, which includes strategies of enforcement. The Bird Safe um, Buildings Alliance is here to provide support for intro 1482A. Awareness about this issue has increased exponentially in recent years, and it is driving successful innovation by glass manufacturers. Legislation is of critical importance for greater adoption, and we at the BSBA know very well, so are design guidelines. Among other comments that we have submitted in writing, we highly recommend that the requirement for this development of specific guidelines is included in the final language of intro 1482. It is staggering to us to imagine that the equivalent of one New York City is being built every month globally for the next 40 years. That's almost 480 new New York Cities around the world by 2050. This means that today and every night and day for the foreseeable future, manufacturing plants are producing never-ending float lines of glass to serve this tremendous growth, not to mention the emerging retrofit markets for existing buildings. We can influence the impact that this glass will have on the global environment. New York City prides itself in being referenced as a model city, as a measure of what is possible, and as a leader by example. This legislation provides an opportunity to do both. In our written uh, technical submission, we have provided comments that we think will improve the ability for design teams and owners to apply uh, the criteria um, that the intro describes, and also how um, the definitions can improve um, giving credit to project teams for all the materials that are in play on uh, our buildings. And of course, lastly, we do recommend that the compliance guidelines be added as a requirement in the intro. Thank you. Oh, it's okay. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. My name is Georgia Silvera Siemens. I'm here as a private individual 
I'm in favor of the bird-friendly glass bill on the floor. I'm a New York City resident and bird watcher. My birding patch is Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village. It's a pleasure to watch birds year round and especially during the spring and fall migration season and fall migration season has begun. New York City's position in the Atlantic Flyway plus the Green Space Network in the city makes our city a stopover hotspot for migratory birds. However, our built environment is detrimental to these birds that we know, love, and enjoy seeing. I know the bill would not absolutely eliminate bird strikes, but the shocking number of bird deaths annually from glass collisions should and can be reduced. We have the technology to do so, and uh, being in this room today, I know that we have the social and political will to do so as well. So I'd like to thank City Council, New York City Audubon, the Bird Friendly Glass Alliance, and all the folks in the audience who are here to give voice to birds who can't speak for themselves. So thank you. Thank you. Before um, my colleague asks questions, um, I would like to say that um, there's a false narrative that says people of color do not care about the environment and or uh, are not pet friendly and or are not environmentally and, eco and um, ecologically uh, have an understanding uh, of, of that. So you represent, uh, unbeknownst to yourself, uh, dispelling that false narrative. So thank you for your, your testimony. You're welcome. Barry Gudentrick from the Great Borough of Queens. Where we have great birding and great birds. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I, this is for really anybody on the panel. Um, do we, I, I don't know, so hopefully you can um, answer this question. I'm sure you can. Do we know why birds can't deal with glass as opposed to buildings? And I'm sure there's a ready answer, but I just don't know what it is. Same reason people can't deal with glass. And I'll bet you almost everybody in this room has smacked into a glass door or glass wall. Glass is transparent. We learn about it when we're little kids without killing ourselves. Birds did not evolve with glass. Um, and they treat what they see literally. So they are either looking through it or they're seeing a reflection which they believe is habitat. Um, and so they don't slow down, they just keep going. So the way we stop them um, is to apply patterns on glass, which to them are literally something they can't fly through. It doesn't say, here's glass. It says, Here, here's a tree, <laughs> and you gotta go around. And they don't have the problem, like we don't, with buildings, because we can see a building and generally we can avoid objects, although, even as you, you have a whole list of cues that you use to tell you where glass is. You see mullions. You know that right angles are not natural. Birds never understand any of that. The concept of glass as a transparent or reflective barrier is just not something that gets into their heads. They can learn about individual local pieces of glass if they don't die the first time, which is why so many pigeons are still around. Um, but they, they don't learn it, especially these migrants are flying from one place to another, landing where they've never been before. And then they have to look for food. They have to regain their energy. And when they do that, they're just as likely to fly to a reflected tree as they are to a real tree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. So I, I would just like to uh, offer um, <laughs> what I'm faced with as the chair of housing and buildings and one of those things is residential affordability. And in dealing with develop, the, the reason that it's important to have a conversation about efficiency and cost effectiveness in doing this, I don't believe that um, residential affordability and being bird friendly are mutually exclusive. However, that's not the narrative, unfortunately, that I get when I'm dealing with developers. So I need to have a counter argument that suggests some cost effective and cost efficient ways of making sure that we can meet the mandate of this legislation and any other legislation going forward that protects animals in this city. Um, so I'd like to continue to work with you on the different types of materials that are available and as technology advances itself, as it seems to do every 30 seconds, that we're on the cutting edge and, uh, and uh, have the ability to offer opportunities for developers to do the right thing, whether it's in going forward or in retrofitting buildings. So I look forward to having an ongoing dialogue that suggests 
that we have alternatives available to meeting these needs in a cost-effective manner. So there's no excuses. <laughs> no excuses. Thank you. Thank you. What do we do with our testimony? So we're going to call the next panel. Joseph Rosenberg, David Karopkin, Karopkin Robert Bate, Liz York, and Patricia Akare. I'm sure I killed that. I apologize. I'm sorry, Rita McMahon. Please join us to offer your testimony. Okay. I'll Just give me one second. Let's give um, our last panelist an opportunity to make her way. And again, I ask that you begin by your testimony by offering your name in full for the record. No. And I believe we can begin whenever you're ready. My name is Patricia Ockrey. As a New York City Audubon Project Safe Flight volunteer, I have witnessed the impact that skyscrapers with sheer glass have on migrating birds. For the past several years, I visited five skyscrapers in the downtown western neighborhood near the World Trade Center and found many migrating warblers, oven birds, all beautiful specimens fallen by the confusing reflective glass that is in their way. The Atlantic Flyway is the path that birds have taken for eons, and now human needs are hindering their ability to reach their wintering grounds and their breeding grounds safely. As our population grows, it is important for us humans to consider the rest of the natural world in our structures. The Javits Center is a great example of how a change to the design and the fenestration saved thousands of birds on their biannual journeys. During the spring of 2019, as I was picking up four or five warblers in front of the World Trade Center, a construction worker asked me had I been to three World Trade Center, which is not even on our route. He said, it is a horror show. So many birds had fallen there, 17 in all. The police were summoned, the building cordoned off, and a hazmat worker arrived to deal with hazardous gas. The hazard was glass. The birds crashed into it. The danger was to the birds, not the people. How much longer can we humans think that we are the only living creatures who matter? Here are two of the four most, most recent specimens I found two days ago, a northern water thrush and a Blackburnian warbler. I have pictures here. I hope that you can find a way for humans to coexist co co with the beautiful and wild creatures who were here first. I wholeheartedly support this bill. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Robert Bate. I'm a uh, former president of the Brooklyn Bird Club and I am currently the executive vice president on the uh, board of directors of New York City Audubon. Um, the Brooklyn Bird Club stands behind the testimony of New York City Audubon, the American Bird Conservancy, and the other um, experts in the field in support of the legislation protecting the local environment, especially as it concerns migrating and resident bird populations. In addition, we'd also like to point out a building project that is emblematic of the hazards facing birds as they navigate our urban landscape. Developers in Brooklyn are proposing a 500-foot glass building on the east side of New York City's treasured Brooklyn Botanic Garden to be built at 960 Franklin Avenue. This structure, with its highly reflected, proposed highly reflective glass facade, should it be built, it would be a a serious bird strike hazard 
In addition, it will cast a huge shadow of the, over the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens and its world-famous conservancy in the morning, as well as cooking the conservancy in the gardens with sun glare later in the day. New York City needs a more enlightened building planning strategy to address long, looming climate and environmental concerns. Um, you know, uh, the question that arises about how, how birds uh, navigate our urban landscape, um, one, of, one of the solutions in, involves um, using uh, ultraviolet, you know, coatings and things. Birds see differently than we do. They, they uh, can see into the ultraviolet spectrum, and um, so things that would be, appear virtually clear to us, you know, will appear as a solid object to them. Um, so it's like there are, there are many solutions, you know, and, uh, you know, it's like I encourage you to make use of these experts that spoke before me because they, they have that wealth of knowledge that, that you're, you know, you're seeking as ammunition. So um, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure speaking. Thank you. Good morning. My name is David Karopkin. I'm a lifelong Brooklynite. Uh, wildlife resident, uh, excuse me, wildlife advisor to and on the board of directors of VFAR, Voters for Animal Rights. I'm also the founder and former director of Goose Watch NYC, an organization that worked for several years to protect and advocate for coexistence with urban wildlife in New York City, work that I'm now doing with VFAR. I'm submitting testimony in support of intro 1482, which would require uh, using bird-friendly glass. In our view, New Yorkers are incredibly fortunate to share our city with hundreds of species of wildlife who live among us, including migratory birds who pass through our city every year. These animals are our neighbors, representing a diverse ecosystem, and we have a responsibility to coexist with them. <clears throat> As has been said, each year, tens if not hundreds of thousands of migratory birds are killed or injured, crashing into New York City's glass skyscrapers on their migration, a number that is in the billions across the country. These birds cannot see the glass, mistake their reflections for inviting habitat or sky and crash into the buildings. Some die instantly while others fall to the ground with concussions, broken limbs or wings and other injuries and suffer in severe pain. As a New York State licensed wildlife rehabilitator, I receive dozens of phone calls every year from New Yorkers requesting assistance with birds found injured in this tragic and preventable way. Bird-friendly glass will reduce these casualties, and this legislation will better allow our concrete jungle to serve as the wild habit, wildlife habitat that it should and can be. We're excited that New York City is moving forward with significant improvements in the availability and application of this ethical and effective wildlife management policy and gratified for initiatives such as this. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Joseph Rosenberg, Director of the Catholic Community Relations Council, representing the Archdiocese of New York and the Diocese of Brooklyn on local legislative affairs. We certainly support the concept of embracing measures that protect birds. There are clearly many dangers to the bird population in our city, and this legislation would help lessen the hazard of birds for flying to reflective glass. We do, however, have concerns with the bill that I would like to bring to your attention. The bill requires that at least 90% of all exterior glazing on the lowest 75 feet of any building must consist of bird-friendly glass. The fiscal impact of removing existing glass and purchasing and installing bird-friendly glass is unclear. The legislation is silent regarding if this mandate is retroactive, therefore requiring all buildings in New York City to comply with this measure, or if it is prospective and covers only new developments. It also does not clarify if alterations or renovations to existing buildings trigger this requirement, and if so, what is the threshold of work that would require glass replacement? These are all important issues for us. Religious organizations have scarce financial resources and confront daily challenges in covering our operating expenses. Unfunded mandates create financial difficulties in our continuing efforts to develop and operate schools, run human service provider facilities for the elderly, the disabled, and the needy, and construct much needed low-income housing for residents of our city. We suggest that if religious organizations are not exempted, that we at least be provided with financing to accomplish the mandates of this bill. It is also not clear at all how stained glass windows would be impacted by this bill. Hundreds of churches, synagogues, and mosques contain stained glasses, which is enduring symbols of faith and beauty. They're sources of pride to, for all congregations, and in fact, for many New Yorkers and tourists who visit these, these sacred buildings. The legislation defines bird-friendly glass as glass or glazing with a maximum fact, threat factor of 25. Stained glass panels contain many individual pieces of colored glass framed by lead soldering. Are these valuable and historical windows classified above the threat factor of 25 and therefore a danger to birds? 
If so, where are they covered by the facade material type, a threat factor chart, or does stained glass pose no problems to birds? A report entitled Bird-Friendly Building Design provides guidance on this question. It is published by the American Bird Conservancy and the Audubon Society and discusses how to protect birds when designing buildings. The authors state that opaque, etched, stained, or frosted glass are excellent options to reduce or eliminate collisions, and I quote, certainly the council's intent cannot be to require the removal, alteration, or covering of stained glass windows in houses of worship or prevent its use in future sanctuaries. We therefore urge that the council relies on this report and amends the bill to exclude stained glass from these mandates. Thank you. Duly noted. Thank you, council. Rita McMahon, I'm the director of the Wild Bird Fund. You know we're very rich with wildlife, and it's our 50,000 acres of parkland, marshland, and abandoned land make us an oasis on the dense urban landscape of the Northeast Coast. When birds arrive in New York City, they find diverse habitat, food, and shelter in all five boroughs. They also find a gauntlet of tall glass buildings, each reflecting the open sky, inviting them to fly through. After successfully flying thousands of miles, a bird strikes the glass and then falls to the pavement below, sometimes 10, 20, 30 stories down to the sidewalk. At best, one third survive. New York's tall buildings with their reflective and transparent glass are a lethal threat to, determined to be a lethal threat to over 100 threatened and endangered migratory birds. We know about New York City Audubon's volunteers work for uh, Project Safe Flight, and they pick up the birds and the lucky ones are brought to us, those that are still alive or they die in transport but most of Wild Bird Fund's collision patients are brought in by compassionate New Yorkers who have found a songbird, woodcock, or falcon at the base of a glass building. We treat about 1,000 a year. Our window strike patients suffer from concussions, damage to their eyes, beaks. They have broken wings, broken legs, and internal injuries. Again, just over one-third survive despite our best efforts. But there is something to do to stop the carnage. A case in point is the Javits Center. And remember those numbers. They cut at 90 to 95 percent the lethal deaths. They were, I mean, they cut deaths 90 to 95 percent. They cut collisions. The Wild Birds Fund supports the New York City Council's proposed intro 1482 to safeguard birds passing through New York. Reducing window strikes by 90 percent, as the Javits Center did, could equal 90,000 lives saved each year. There are so many threats to wildlife, federal reversals of environmental policies, habitat loss, light pollution, climate change. We have to do what we can locally to make New York a safe harbor. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your testimony. Um, again, I just want to reiterate uh, that on, from my perspective as the chair, I'm trying to find the most effective and efficient ways to get it done, to remove all barriers for, from pushback from developers. So uh, it is duly noted that uh, stained glass may need to be required as an exception. Um, that is, you know, so that's something that we, we were already ready to explore, just for, 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 the, for the record. Thank you. We are going to call the next panel, uh, Mary Mooney, Adita Bernkrant, Caitlin Zafonte, Kathy Altman, Chrisula Melik Mel Melitakis, and Liz York.
Two panels? So let me just call it again so I can make sure. Liz York. Chrisula. Kathy Altman. Caitlin Zafante. Adita Bernkrant. Was I even close? Yeah. All right. you got it. <laughs> Mary Mooney. Okay. Uh, Chelsea Lawrence. And Michelle Ashkin. Thank you. I ask before you begin your testimony that you identify yourself with your full name for the record. Thank you. You can begin whenever you're ready. My name is Mary Mooney, and I'm a volunteer district leader with the Humane Society of the United States of New York, in New York. I also hold a New York State Wildlife Rehabilitators license and have been a volunteer uh, in the past with the Wild Bird Fund, New York City's only wildlife rehabilitation center. I'm here to support intro 1482, which would require the installation of bird-friendly glass on new buildings to protect bird species, particularly migratory birds traveling through New York twice a year. Every year in New York City, as many as 230,000 birds succumb to injuries from collisions with the smooth glass currently used. Birds in flight do not see buildings. They see only the reflection of the open sky behind them and are not aware of flying directly into lethal obstacles. Wildlife volunteers, like me, are familiar with the caseload of injured and dying birds brought to the Wild Bird Fund, especially during the migratory seasons. All too often, rescuers are ordinary New Yorkers. If you do the intake, you are very aware of this often distressed and overwhelmed by the inhumane suffering and loss of avian life resulting from collisions. The birds that move through our urban skies cannot change their century-old migratory routes. Their biannual flights and their stopover in our city are an observable phenomenon enjoyed by many New Yorkers. At the same time, the burden falls on us to understand this behavior. We have a responsibility to enable the coexistence of wild birds in an ever more densely developed habitat full of danger. As our buildings grow in number and height, we are creating an increasingly hazardous environment. Intro 1482 is humane and fair and will accommodate the safe passage of birds flying through our, through our city seasonally, as well as the birds that depend on our urban habitat all year long. It is a forward-looking law that expresses our willingness to treat our bird population as a natural resource that, is, that needs to be humanely protected and encouraged. I support this bill and thank you for your, test, for your opportunity to give me to testimony today. Thank you. Hi, thank you, committee. My name is Adita Bernkrant and I'm the executive director of NICLASS, an animal advocacy nonprofit organization founded in 2008 in New York City with supporters in all five boroughs and I'm a resident of Queens. NICLASS is strongly in support of intro 1482A, which would require that glass installed on newly built or altered buildings be constructed with bird-friendly glass to reduce the high number of bird strike fatalities. We commend Councilmember Espinal, Speaker Corey Johnson, and the other bill co-sponsors for introducing this progressive, common-sense legislation to make our city more humane by creating a bird-friendly skyline. Birds play an important part in our ecosystem and we should do all we can to protect them. Over 100 species of birds that we know of have collided with buildings in our city. The spring and fall are particularly bad for the, deadly for the dozens of species of migrating birds passing through. Um, and as we have heard, New York City Audubon estimates that 90,000 to 230,000 birds die every year in our city. Um, some of these birds die instantly, but some first suffer severe traumas such as broken wings, internal injuries, and concussions. And um, the Wild Bird Fund says they treat between 600 to 800 birds annually who have suffered such traumas from building collisions. When we know better, we can do better. There is no reason to continue constructing buildings in such a way that creates math, mass bird deaths now that we know there is a simple solution. The Javits Center in Hell's Kitchen is a perfect example of the success of implementing bird-friendly measures. 
before it was redesigned to include bird safe glass, the Javits Center was one of the biggest bird death sites in our city. And after the renovations, bird collisions decreased by 95%. With intro 1482A, we have a wonderful opportunity to create a different future without these dismal, deadly bird death statistics. I urge you to pass intro 1482 so that we can make New York City more humane for our winged residents and visitors. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kaylin Zafonti. I'm a New York City resident in Bill Perkins District and a longtime animal rescuer. Uh, I strongly support intro 1482A. Um, as it's been said, more than 100,000 migratory birds are killed in New York City each year as a result of crashing into windows. I've come across birds with broken wings, concussions, and other brain injuries countless times on sidewalks after they mistake a glass siding for the sky's reflection and crash directly into the building. Moreover, numerous times in my almost 10 years in New York City, I've come across dead birds on the sidewalk at the foot of a building, likely killed upon impact. We all take pride in our city's great infrastructure, but the way it has been built has proved deadly to these birds who are simply following their natural instincts. Humans have created this problem and the animals should not suffer as a result. Fortunately, it is not difficult for us to make changes to prevent such unnecessary suffering and death. I'm proud to live in a progressive city that shows compassion to even its smallest and most vulnerable members a city that is not merely concerned about the bottom line and willing to sacrifice thousands of lives each year. A sincere thank you to Council Member Espinal and the other bill sponsors. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Chrysula Mihalakis, um, and I'm here to explain why I'm in favor of this legislation. First, I'd like to thank you for your time here today and for your service to the city. I am a lifelong New Yorker. I grew up in Astoria, Queens, and I currently live in the Upper West Side. I'm pro-New York. I love this city. I want to see its inhabitants flourish and the city thrive. Um, and as a Queens native, I'm thrilled by Long Island City's growth, which is in part manifested by shiny new glass skyscrapers. And I'm grateful for all the jobs and housing that comes along with these structures. In fact, I started my career in one of uh, Long Island City's, city's first glass buildings. But at the same time, I'm deeply troubled by the unintended negative effect of these structures on avian life. And the foreseeable escalation of this issue, if we don't act now, by the increasing number of glass buildings in New York, is frightening. And I know other New Yorkers care as well. Everyone with whom I speak on this issue is angered and wants a solution. And the scale of this issue especially because there's such severely detrimental harm to wildlife, is an easy issue to rally behind. Every time I come across a dead bird on our street, my heart breaks. And I think about the thousands of miles this bird has flown and how its life was cut short in an instant due to no fault of its own. So the progress of New York and caring for avian life are not mutually exclusive. This bill is a win-win and its minimal requirements is not a deterrent for building construction in New York. We have a responsibility to ensure that New York is continuously grown in a responsible manner. New Yorkers demand it, and anything less is inexcusable. Please support this bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chelsea Lawrence, and I I'm here to support uh, in 1482, and I strongly agree with all of the preceding testimony in favor for this bill. Um, I am a software QA. I live in Brooklyn. I spend all my free time birding uh, and observing birds is how I relax. Uh, when I learned that 90 to 230,000 birds die each year in New York City alone, I signed up uh, to be a Project Safe Flight Bom volunteer. I had no idea how grim that task was, uh, circling the One World Trade Center and finding you know, really brilliant warblers. These aren't pigeons and sparrows, some of them are, but they're really beautiful, sunny, neotropical, vibrant warblers. Uh, they're beautiful woodcocks, birds that you wouldn't believe existed, um, that people travel to see to bird, uh, and they end up hitting our glass buildings. Um, they end up getting stunned, swept into trash, if they survive the window collision, they're usually run over or stepped on, and I've seen this happen, and it's pretty heartbreaking. Um, this is a totally preventable thing, and I totally support Int 
1482. Um, I hope that New York City can become a leader in, in this and we can have some real bird-friendly buildings. Thank you for the chance to speak. Thank you so much for your testimony. Appreciate it. We're going to call the uh, next panel. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hi. My name is Michelle Ashkin. Uh, I'm here to support the uh, legislation 1482A. Uh, I live in Battery Park City, and I witness every day the uh, I pick up birds every day. Uh, there are some buildings that are worse than others, but Battery Park City is a, is a, is a real hazard for these animals. Um, I also recently went to the Hudson Yards, and as beautiful as all those buildings were, I could not begin to enjoy the beauty because all I could see was dead birds falling out of the sky, not literally, but just understanding what these buildings were going to, and these are brand new buildings that just went up. I'm not going to re repeat anything that anybody else has said. I want to address some of the things that I've heard said here. Um, in response to this, the cost for developers, what I would like to say is that when we're talking about these beautiful, luxury, high-rise buildings that are going up, the wealthiest amongst us are those who are buying those, those apartments and renting those apartments. These are, these, I, I'm concerned about um, what I'm hearing because I, when I look at those buildings in Hudson Yards, I can't afford them. Many of us can't afford them. So the cost to those developers, I question why, why that's a cost. I understand it for certain uh, residential properties, but for other residential properties and the new buildings that are going up, I really don't think that that's an issue. I think that that's an excuse, and I'd like you to consider that. Um, I also wanted to mention, I know that the Audubon Society mentioned that they have D-Bird, which is their database. I know you had questioned that before. And in order to make that perhaps, because it's a system that already exists, I think it would be incumbent upon the council people to maybe um, work with Audubon, with the D-Base, maybe get 311 as the place where people call, and then 311 can somehow you know, hook into that database so that it makes it easy for people and ed to educate people where to call and what to do. Um, and I, I have a question also about the specifications of height in this bill. It says uh, 75 feet and below. Um, but Rita had, from Wild Bird Fund had mentioned that we see birds, we think we see birds falling from 10, 20, 30 stories above. So I'm concerned about the specifications of that 75 feet um, and would like you to revisit those with the experts that have spoken on this issue. So as, as, that's absolutely what we intend to do. The, the, the meeting of these hearings is not, not the, the meaning is not for finality. It's actually to get as much input as we can to get the best bill we possibly can Great. get. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call the next panel. G. Joshua Stoneman. Zeneb Samin. Margaret Lee. And Bradley Harris. I'm sorry, and Gabriel Willow. As you may observe, observe, there is another hearing about to take place right behind us, so I ask if you can keep your testimony concise so that we can run smoothly as we transition from this hearing to the next. Again, Gabriel Willow, G. Joshua Stoneman, Zeneb Simin, Margaret Lee. Is that your name? No, no, you can't. Okay, then it's fine. You'll go on the, no, 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 it's not the last panel. Bradley Harris. Okay. Ann Seligman. Randy Klein. You had a somewhat uh, Price is Right response to that. It's not, not quite that exciting, but. <laughs> the first time I've ever 
Um, I, I ask that you uh, state your first and last name for the record before you begin your testimony. You can begin whenever you're ready, from wherever you're ready. So I'm, uh, I'm actually throwing out the testimony that I wrote because so much of it has been well said by other people before. Um, and I want to limit my remarks to things you have not heard. Um, I am here speaking as an individual, but I am also a, a member of Manhattan Community Board 6. And um, I'm sorry, we lost uh, Carlina. Um, last year, we passed a bill um, uh, we passed a resolution supporting a state-level bill that would require the New York City Department of Buildings to develop regulations to deter, deter bird strikes. It passed unanimously, and I believe the support for that bill, which goes further than this one and deals with more than glass, um, demonstrates the concern that even non-birders have for, wild, for, for protecting wildlife in New York City. Um, I also wanted to mention or sort of highlight a dynamic, or a dilemma that you, you raised, that developers are the ones bearing the cost. The cost can be very minimal, and in fact, in, it can reduce operating costs, but the developers aren't paying the operating costs. Um, so that if energy costs are reduced, which of course, we all want energy reduction and energy costs reduced, the developers are still paying however minimal that cost is, they are paying it and not reaping the benefits. And I think if there's some way to sort of cut that Gordian knot, that's a way to get the buy-in from the developers that you're looking for. So that's something that we deal with. Midtown East is my community board. Um, so that, that's a big issue. Um, and those bird protecting measures really can be cost savers. I also wanted to highlight, since I have nine seconds, my own experiences rescuing birds. And they're so beautiful in flight or even perching, but once you hold them, they're just this little sad pile of feathers and it's, it's, it's not what we want this city to be. Thank you very much for, for taking this up. Thank you for your testimony. Hi, my name is Margaret Lee. For some reason, I'm the only one here with a bird on their head. Um, I'm, I'm a longtime resident of District 1 of New York City and a voter for animal rights. I'm here on behalf of my feathered friends speaking in favor of intro 1482A, the bill to require buildings in New York City be built with bird safe glass. As someone who cares deeply for my non-human neighbors, I've come to know up close firsthand the many, many ways they suffer here and have concluded that New York City is a terribly heartbreaking hellhole for them. We appear to be a city hell-bent on waging a war against God's creatures. I thank City Council Speaker Corey Johnson and all the others involved in co-sponsoring this bill and being a voice for our bird residents and migratory visitors. My hope is that this bill and its urgent need for passage will be just the start of New York City becoming a truly compassionate city for its non-human inhabitants and those who are just passing through. In addition to birds being saved from crashing into windows, I want to see them provided with clean, fresh water and food. I want to see them given the respect they deserve. I want to see all buildings forbidden from washing their sidewalks with the soapy, toxic chemicals that poison our birds as they seek just a drop of water. I want to see them protected from netters who capture them to be shot at gun clubs. I want these villainous netters treated as the egregious felons they are. Corey and all you other co-sponsors, are you listening? We need more bills to protect our feathered friends. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my name is Bradley Harris. I'd just like to thank you for giving this conversation the dignity that it deserves by sitting through um, all these comments largely in agreement with one another. It means a lot to the community and it's a great thing that you're doing. Uh, so my name is Bradley Harris. I'm here to speak in favor of bird safe uh, glass legislation. I think most people don't think of New York City as a haven for biodiversity. Uh, it's a shame. 
Uh, people like to say that the city is filled with what my friend Gabriel Willow describes as bagel hunters, <laughs> sparrows, and pigeons. Uh, but what we have come to realize throughout the course of this conversation is that um, you know, up to 20% of all species in the United States fly through Central Park each year at one point or another. Uh, people don't realize until they get involved in the birdie community that this is a migratory pathway and it goes well beyond the sparrows and the pigeons when you're walking through Central Park. Uh, while I'm here in my personal capacity, I'll say that I'm also on the Board of Governors at the Princeton Association of New York City and our most popular event that draws people in from all over the tri-state area is our birding events that are usually hosted by Gabriel Willow and the Audubon Society. This is a reason people come to New York City. They spend their time in New York City. They travel from all over, and this is something that's been covered in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. This is a really important feature of New York City, and its, um, and its, um, and it, and its activities for its communities. It, I appreciate the time that you've given it, uh, and I just want to say that you shouldn't underestimate the birding community's capacity to report on these incidents. I think by, by the very feature of how many turned out today in support of the legislation, you probably get an idea of how effective they might be in reporting bird strikes. And that, of course, would be a minimal cost to, to the city, so it's something to consider. Thank you. Yeah, so you saw my question centered around that I think it's important that we can be able to show progress by, by being able to substantiate the numbers, which was demonstrated by the Audubon Society that there are measurement tools in place. Um, I'd like to see how we can partner as a city agency to be able to capture those numbers uh, effectively and efficiently and have them at our disposal going forward. So I look forward to working with you on that. Um, hello, thank you for holding this hearing today, um, council members and chairman. Um, my name is Gabriel Willow and um, uh, there's been so much compelling testimony today from students and birders and conservationists and architects and I, I don't know how much I can really add. Um, as you've heard, uh, maybe, uh, or gathered, I'm a, a tour guide, a, a, nat a naturalist, ecologist, and, and guide, and I've been leading nature walks um, around the city for over 15 years, close to 20 now, um, through New York City Audubon, uh, Wave Hill, uh, and various other uh, organizations. Um, I signed up today representing the New York Linnaean Society. I'm on their board, and uh, the Linnaean Society is the oldest um, bird-focused uh, naturalist organization in the city. Um, but I do also work with New York City Audubon and others. Um, I actually came straight here from leading a walk in the Battery, in Battery Park, and we saw about 20 different species of birds. There was about a dozen participants on the walk. It's a free walk. Actually, I invite you all to come on one of my walks sometimes. We're hearing a lot of sad stories about dead birds, but it's so moving and compelling to see the live birds as well. And if you ever just want to come out in a park and, and look, it's, it's a lot of fun. And this morning we saw seven or eight different species of warbler, including a, a Nashville warbler, which in spite of its name, it's sort of a misnomer, actually nests up in the boreal forests of Canada. And when you know their history, it's so moving to think of this bird having nested, having been born. It was an immature. This bird's a few months old. It was born in a spruce tree somewhere in central Canada, probably. And it's flying all the way to northern South America. And just to think of the, the, the maze it has to transverse. And they're moving south. So I knew this bird in the battery had just traveled the entire length of Manhattan. And to think of all the buildings it had to pass en route. Um, I was thinking about this bill and, and thinking about that bird and just the, uh, just the amazing fact that it had survived, that it made it. And I was glad that to see that one bird made it through. But this bill has the opportunity to ensure that hundreds of thousands of other individuals will survive and it seems like a win-win really for everybody. So I, I hope you'll pass it. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I'm G. Joshua Stoneman. I live on East 10th Street in Manhattan. And I'm here today as a concerned citizen. Um, I'm in support of the Bird Friendly, Friendly Glass Bill, Intro 1482. This bill is very important to me because I believe New York City is the greatest city in the world, and it would be even greater if we took the lead on reducing unnecessary bird deaths from buildings. A bit about myself, I've lived in Manhattan since 1993 when I came here after college. Currently I work at the Lockheed Martin Corporation where I work with power companies and large commercial customers like landlords 
to make the switch to energy efficiency and clean energy technology. And like everyone else here, I'm playing hooky from work because this is very important to me. So thanks everyone for, uh, for your time today. Um, like many New Yorkers, I've lived in and worked in at least a dozen neighborhoods since I moved here. And in every neighbor neighborhood that I've lived in and worked in, I find dead birds on the sidewalk. And it's not just pigeons, it's beautiful songbirds and native species that should not be dead on the concrete. I think about these birds making their brave flights every spring and fall, some of them flying across the ocean to South America or the islands of the Caribbean. They have to survive hurricanes, storms, cold fronts, predators, and a myriad of other obstacles. It's not fair that they fly thousands of miles only to collide with a glass window in New York. Uh, this bill, the bird-friendly glass bill, would not cost New Yorkers like us, um, it would make the city a better place and it fits with the spirit of this great city, which is providing a better opportunity to survive and thrive for both humans and birds. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, if you need a note for work, I'll, I'll be glad to provide one for you. Please, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I'm last. Uh, hi, my name is Randy Klein, I'm from Harlem. Uh, I have absolutely no idea that I would find myself sitting here. I know nothing about birding. I know nothing about architecture. Uh, I, the last place I thought I'd find myself was participating in a city council meeting. So the Price is Right emotion was because I think it's a privilege and an honor to be able to voice your opinion and make a difference, especially in the political climate that we live in, but I won't go there. Um, basically, I now just want to share the overwhelming, I don't have anything eloquent to say other than there is a personal sense of dread and anxiety and gloom every morning and afternoon now when I walk my dog to the park about how many dead birds I'm gonna find laying out in front of a building. I had never experienced this until the building went up and I'm very, with all due respect to FX Collaborative and Dan, I'm learning about the cost of glass and other things. However, with, you know, you still built the building without the glass. So I think at some point there, you know, it's money over morals and somebody else would have built it. So maybe it was like, if not us, you know, then someone else. I don't know how the real estate game works. I know that like everybody, the apartments are, you know, when you're arguing over about like a $2.9 million apartment and whether or not you can afford better glass, uh, I'm not really sure how big of an issue that is. Um, but now I found a guy in my neighborhood that I need to text every morning to come pick up the dead birds because he then transports them to the Wild Bird Fund or to his own freezer where he keeps a mini bird morgue uh, until he can get them to the Museum of Natural History so that they can log them. It's an amazing infrastructure. I had no idea this community existed. It's a fascinating and dedicated group of people uh, that I now find myself a part of. So I'm committed to doing what I can to make a difference because I live in this city. I've lived here my whole life and it's my home and I hope you make it a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanna say that um, understanding the ecological value of preserving birds, I think is incredibly important. Testimony earlier was, was uh, presented that talked about you know, how, how birds uh, are responsible for um, uh, uh, killing other uh, animals that have negative impacts on the city. So that, that ecology, I think we, we go away from here in the city, where in other parts of the country, they, they follow the ecological map to the T. I think we can't continue to be responsible citizens and uh, considered to be the most progressive city um, in the country and not really look at uh, ecology uh, and, and negate its negative potential for negative impact on all of us as humans in, in general. So thank you so much for the testimony that you provided today and thank you for all of the advocates who are here today on behalf of that. We have one last panel. Thank you. Uh, Kalista McRae, Joshua Malbin, and Nisarga Markal, Markal Dai.
Okay, I ask you to obviously uh, give your first and last name for the record before offering your testimony. My name is Chris. Uh, I, I do want to say before you begin, you have the large responsibility of closing this out with some epic testimony. <laughs> so you're on. Uh, thank you. My name is Callista McRae, and I apologize for my single space testimony. Uh, thank you for considering intro 1482, which I very much support. I'm not a biologist or conservationist, but I sometimes have to head to teach at early hours before the sidewalks around buildings have been swept. And in this area, I see more injured and dead birds than I'd ever thought I would see. Uh, the issue was not on my radar at all until the fall of 2016 when I moved to New York City. For a while, I did not put two and two together. The first bird I saw by chance, it was a tiny little kinglet who I realize now had hit a glass sky bridge and fallen into the road. In that case, he was only stunned, and when I touched him, he flew off, uh, but this was a fluke. He was the size of a cotton ball and the color of moss. The next three birds I found under walkways were not so lucky. Some had been stepped on repeatedly. It's very, very easy not to notice these birds. New York is taking a real toll on species that are increasingly threatened. I began writing the testimony you have over the weekend, and I put together some photos of the birds I had recently seen. Then yesterday morning on Monday, I found five more. That's a tiny fraction of what's happening. From my commute alone, I have more than 50 photos of dead birds, and that's not counting the injured ones or the ones I saw before I realized what was happening. There are buildings I've come to dread passing, uh, but I don't want to change the route I take to work because a stunned bird in need of help could be sitting there. One thing that really does give me hope uh, is this wonderful bill and the chance also that it will be a model to other cities. So I very much hope you will pass this bill. After I printed the testimony I've given to you, I found another four birds. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, council members. My name is Nisarga Markindaya, and I'm a resident of Park Slope in Brooklyn. I'm a software engineer by profession, but I've been an avid wildlife enthusiast all throughout my life. I grew up in the city of Bangalore, India, where I witnessed the city getting urbanized to a great extent. The city originally had a lot of green spaces, trees, and parks, and due to uncontrolled growth, these green spaces gradually vanished. When I was young, I would see a lot of sparrows and other housebirds, but now it's really rare to see them. They have died due to their homes being chopped off, the water bodies which dried up, and due to a city which did not take action soon enough. We have the privilege of living in the great city of New York, which not only houses so many people, but also these birds, which permanently or temporarily reside here. The vast green spaces we are blessed with attracts their descent as they traverse on their migratory paths twice a year. And when they approach from this great height at a great speed, they collide with the high rises made up of extremely clear glasses, which causes death death or their injury. Just as we strive to give the residents of this great city a safe and good life, we must also strive to support our residents in feathers. Birds are not only great for our ecosystem, but also help in pest control and signal a healthy environment. We need to make sure NYC can host our temporary and permanent bird residents, and I strongly encourage you to support this bill to change our building laws to accommodate our winged friends. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. On behalf of the bill's sponsors, um, Raphael Espinal and my current speaker, Corey Johnson, it was a pleasure to have presented uh, this bill for testimony. Um, it was great to hear from the passionate advocates and regular citizens of the city about how important this bill is. I look forward to going back and, if necessary, tweaking the bill and presenting to you the most effective and efficient bill uh, with the best results possible in the very near future. Thank you so much. We, this, this meeting is adjourned.